Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's BioExcel webinar, the latest in our webinar series, um, restarting after the summer break. Uh, my name's Adam Carter and um, I'm going to spend the next three or four minutes telling you a little bit about the BioExcel project and tell you a few things before we get started. And then our main presenter today, Mark Van Dyke, is going to tell you about MD Studio microservice based molecular dynamics workflows. So uh, before I say any more, I should just let you know that this webinar is being recorded, um, including the question and answer session at the end, uh, and it will be made available on YouTube afterwards and the BioExcel website. So if you want to catch up with it then or some of our past webinars, you can, you can look online. So uh, just for those of you who are, are less familiar possibly with the, the BioExcel project and the, the Center of Excellence, um, this is a, a fairly new centre of excellence. We've been launched for about two years now. Um, and there are three sort of main aspects to what the centre is doing. The first one uh, is to uh, work with certain key pieces of biomolecular software that are widely used. You may have heard of Gromax, Haddock, CPMD. Um, they're the three main codes that the, the project is working on. And we have some of the lead developers from these codes in, in the project itself. Um, the second strand of the project is about usability. Um, and so one thing that's very important to us, as well as having codes that perform well in theory, is to allow them to be used uh, well as part of scientific workflows. So we're looking at uh, various different workflow platforms and how these can be used to, to increase the usability of um, the, the codes that are listed above. And the final part of the project is uh, consultancy and training working with um, end users and that's one of the uh, these webinars are part of that aspect of the project so we want to introduce you to, to some of the work that's going on in BioExcel and also the related work uh, of interest uh, like what we're going to hear about today with MD Studio. One thing that I uh, want to bring to your attention are BioExcel's interest groups um, so if you are interested in any of these things uh, which I expect you will be interested in at least one if you're, you're here today listening to this webinar, then I'd invite you to join one of BioExcel's interest groups. Um, you can do that by going to the main BioExcel webpage at bioexcel.eu uh, and look for, for interest groups there. And another thing to bring to your attention is a, an event that we will be running soon in Amsterdam uh, on the 22nd to the 23rd. Um, this uh, is one of the face-to-face -face meetings that are organized for these interest groups that I mentioned on the, the last slide. It's uh, designed to be a networking event and there's a program of small interactive working groups uh, aligned with the BioExcel interest groups. So the different interest groups will be meeting in different parts of this building and the sessions are designed so that people can walk between different interest groups and, and find out about the different things that are, are going on related to BioExcel. It's a free event um, so you're welcome to attend. Uh, if you'd like to find out more, you can go again to the main BioExcel webpage and look for the community forum. Um, so before I introduce today's speaker, just to let you know that uh, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Um, we should have plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, and the best thing to do if you have a question to ask is to type it into the, the question tool uh, in GoToWebinar. So, you'll see something in your control panel. Yours will look slightly different from this, but it's the same idea. There should be a section called questions. If you click on there to expand it, there'll be a place for you to, to type your question. And at the end, I can either open your microphone if you have one and you can ask your question directly to Mark, or uh, I can pass on the question if you, if you type it into the, to the question window. And if you're watching this webinar later online, um, you can also ask questions on the, the BioExcel forum at ask.bioexcel.eu and we will pick them up and redirect them back to, to our speaker today uh, if, if, um, uh, if we need his, his input to answer your question. Okay, so we'll save the questions to the end uh, and then, um, but if you ha you, you're welcome to type in your questions as you go along so that they're there for us to, um, to look at when we come to the end. So now uh, I'd like to present to you um, Mark Van Dyke. Uh, he studied biology at Utrecht University and obtained his master's degree in biomolecular sciences, 
with a specialization in structural biology uh, in 2005. His PhD research at the NMR department of the Bivot Center for Structural Biology at Utrecht was completed in 2010 on the topic of protein DNA interaction modeling using molecular simulation techniques. Um, since then, he's been involved in various research projects as a postdoc at Cambridge um, and then Utrecht and VU University Amsterdam, where he now holds a senior scientist position. His research focuses on the study of biomolecular interactions using computational molecular modeling and simulation, and he's currently involved in the Dutch eScience Center project, enhancing protein drug binding prediction, where he's working on method development for accurate protein drug binding affinity prediction using free energy methods. And part of this project is the MD Studio software platform for microservice-based MD workflows. Uh, Mark is the project coordinator and lead developer, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about MD Studio today. So uh, I will now hand over to, to Mark. If you're ready, I'll invite you to share your screen, uh, and you can, can take it from here. So if I just make you the presenter, uh, you should be able to, to share your screen now. That's great. Is it visible? Yeah, that's great, Mark. On you go. Good. First of all, uh, Adam, thank you for the kind introduction. I'd like to thank uh, BioXL for giving me the opportunity uh, to present today in a webinar. I'm very excited. Um, today, in the coming 30 minutes or so, I would like to talk to you about uh, the concept of using microservice architectures as a basis for computational workflows. In particular, um, our vision of using this concept for molecular dynamic simulations and modeling routines uh, in the MDCD software platform that we are currently developing. Uh, first thing first, I would like to shortly introduce the computational molecular toxicology group where I'm currently working at the Free University of Amsterdam, led by uh, Daan Geerke. And our research group has a strong interest in using computational simulation and modeling techniques for the rationalization and prediction of drug interactions and metabolism. We have three focus points in the group. The first is uh, force field optimization and MD methodology development. And examples of that are uh, the development of polarizable force fields and topology parameter optimization for small molecules. And that is work that we do in collaboration with the group of Alan Mark at the University of Queensland in Australia. And that's the home of the Automated Topology Builder server, web server. And in addition, we use various free energy methods for our study, uh, including we have interest in using Markov state models to describe dynamics and interactions of the systems that we study. And last but not least, um, we have a focus on making sure that the methods and principles that we develop are also applied in a practical setting. And we do that in collaboration with a number of academic and industrial partners. And a good example of that is our recent collaboration with the industry in the European in ETOX project, where we developed ETOX LI uh, automated uh, workflow that aims in using the linear interaction energy based principles for predicting binding affinity of small molecules to, um, to targets, that's usually drug targets, or to off-targets, such as the cytochrome P450 family, that is responsible for metabolizing and thus detoxifying several xenobiotics. Um, this particular uh, product uh, we are currently further developing, we want to extend the capabilities of it, and that we do in collaboration with the Dutch East Science Center on the project that Adam uh, just mentioned. And that also gave rise to our, um, the start of our project called MD Studio as a basis to further develop flexible workflows um, to, to, to run molecular dynamics and simulation and modeling techniques. So when I talk about automation and workflows, what is it exactly that I'm talking about? Well, first of all, Workflows and automation have been around ever since computers were invent, uh, invented, basically. And a good example of that is the initiation of the Unix platform with the brilliant invention of standard input, standard output, and pipes, which is an excellent example of automation. And from that point on until present day, thanks to technological advances in hardware and software, and the general acceptance of e-science, we have seen a big explosion of all kinds of 
computational automation and workflow management tools for both academia and industry. And I listed only a few here, and the list is very long. And the many products that now are on the market uh, indicates that uh, there's a wide, uh, wide interest in the development and use of these techniques. And there basically should be a solution for anyone to use. So when we were thinking about extending the capabilities of our ETOX allies workflow, uh, we, were, we had a look, close look at all of these different products. And we set up a list of things that we believe are um, important when considering workflow managers. And we came up with four key aspects that e-science workflows generally uh, put a focus on. The first is obviously uh, the focus of the tool itself. It can obviously be autom automation of repetitive tasks or process logic, uh, speed off of CPU intensive tasks or parallelization, uh, provenance, making sure that who produces what, how, and where, and when is recorded and uh, authorized, which is important for uh, reproducing uh, workflows, making sure they're reliable. And of course, for innovation, uh, making use of workflows as a tool for fast prototyping of new methods. The second aspect is components. What are we trying to automize or embed into workflows? Very often these are applications or executables that are linked together into workflows. Uh, they may also include uh, web services that are uh, operated remotely and that we want to use in a workflow chain together, or uh, libraries that perform certain functions. And in almost all cases, definitely in e-science, uh, these workflows are very data intensive. So the data aspect, uh, the data manipulation, uh, the use of database itself is an important aspect of these workflows. Further all, the tools that are developed, um, they work on workflows in various abstract, abstract abstraction levels. Uh, these can be very simple from command lines or interactive use uh, onto a script-based way of building workflows um, to more structured principles, uh, so workflows as files where we formalize workflows, a language or a pattern, uh, usually embedded in sort of a um, uh, graph-like approach, so uh, the acyclic graphs. And finally, um, the various tools that provide uh, the ability to make workflows in a rich graphical user interface. And last but not least, uh, particularly for using automation, um, uh, the backend is very important. These workflows are usually linked to various high performance computer clusters or cloud environments that run virtual machines or uh, Docker containers or grid like systems or to basic workstations in the research environment itself. Uh, and they also include specialized backends such as GPU nodes. So considering these four aspects and the things that they relate to, uh, we went back to our ETOX allies workflow. Our ETOX workflow is a um, integrated workflow that uses various simulation and modeling techniques to perform binary infinity prediction. And in short, the task that are done is uh, there is a topology being produced for the small ligands that we want to make the binary infinity prediction for. Those ligands are docked in the active side of the target that we're looking at, uh, for instance, the cytochrome proteins. And we dock because we want to capture the various orientations that the ligands make have in the active side of the protein. And for uh, we promote clustering on the docking results and for the top uh, five to eight uh, uh, docking poses, we perform an MD simulation. A short MD simulation, usually one to two nanoseconds, and we extract the uh, non bonded energies, van der Waals and metastatics, from those trajectories and combine them in a final data analysis workflow where we do the prediction. And this type of workflow basically captures most of the four key aspects that I've written about. So we're there for automation. We definitely want to speed up the docking part, but certainly the molecular dynamics part. Um, we usually link together a couple of applications, docking applications, molecular dynamics, uh, topology generation and parameterization applications. 
we are reasonably heavy data driven. Uh, we use databases to uh, store data in and we manipulate a lot of data. Uh, we're interested in various levels of abstraction. First of all, for fast prototyping, we may use scripts, but to offer the workflow as a user-friendly end product to the user, we may go all the way to a graphical user interface to make it intuitive to work with the workflow itself. And last but not least, there are several steps in this workflow that require a certain amount of interactivity. For the docking stage, before you go into molecular dynamics, you may want to inspect the, um, the clusters that you get from docking to make sure that the, um, uh, the desired poses meet your requirements before you spend a long uh, MD simulation on perhaps uh, simulating the wrong poses. And last but not least, the LAE prediction itself. Uh, LAE is a method that, um, that requires um, a model to be generated for the predictions and modeling making a model for a series of test compounds is a pretty interactive process and that interactivity would be good to implement in the workflow itself as well. But taking these requirements, uh, we looked again at the options that are currently available and we decided that it may be best to start looking into a little bit of a different way of building micro uh, workflows and that's by using microservices. So microservices are a architecture that belong to the family of service-oriented architectures. And there's not one definition that describes this type of services, but one that comes close to it is that microservices are loosely coupled collaborating services that are in the independent, independently developed and deployed, and they communicate with one another asynchronously, event-driven over a network. Microservices themselves have been around for quite a number of years, but they have recently gained a lot of attention because they are the driving architecture behind the Internet of Things approach. So for building workflows, microservice architectures have six major benefits. The first of it is that they are naturally modular in architecture and that enforced modularity provides a solid basis for workflow-centric applications. Second, they are autonomous specialists, and it means that microservices themselves only need to do one thing, and they need to do it right and reliable. And with that, they require a little knowledge of the system as a whole. Microservices are naturally polyglot ready, which means that uh, they can be implemented using a different programming languages or database, hardware or software environments. And that makes it very easy to deploy various different types of uh, various different types of solution at microservices in a single platform. They promote continuous software development and delivery. And that is a chance that means that the change to a small or a part of the application only requires one or a small number of services to be re rebuilt and redeployed. And when redeployed, um, the entire system as a whole doesn't need to be taken offline, but only the modules that need to be redeployed can be redeployed dynamically in the running environment. Microservices natively support scale up and scale out. It means that they can be deployed on remote hardware that is specialized for high performance uh, computing uh, performance, so they can be linked to, um, uh, to a scheduling service of an, uh, uh, of an HPC resource. Uh, but also, in a more simple way, on multi-core workstations, when you launch multiple instances of the same uh, microservices, you get native scale-up of your performance. And last but not least, microservices are always live within the, uh, in the architecture that they are running, and that promotes an interactive, real-life uh, use of the microservice ecosystem itself. And these six benefits, um, is what we use at the basis of our MD Studio software platform that uses microservices for molecular dynamic and simulation workflows. So I want to go a little bit more in detail about what the core architecture, the microservice architecture of MD Studio is, what type of uh, solutions that we're using and how we deploy them. First of all, the microservice architecture that we use is broker-based. And that means that microservices communicate with one another via an intermediate, and that's a broker. And that broker uh, allows for asynchronous communication, and we go for uh, an open source project uh, that's called Crossbar. 
And Crossbar is a WAMP enterprise ready broker. Uh, it's pretty feature rich, it's, it's fast, it's scalable, and it's, it's promised to be able to hold hundreds of thousands of connections simultaneously and handle tens of thousands of matches per second, which would be more than sufficient for the environment that we are going to use it for. As that communication is WAMP based, which stands for Web Application Messaging Protocols. And that is a protocol that offers sort of full duplex communication over uh, TCP. Uh, it's a WebSocket based communication. It was developed to sort of alleviate the uh, limitations of uh, the current HTTP protocol in doing uh, data intensive communication between a server and a browser, for instance, by having a specific port that is um, continuously open in duplex mode. Uh, the good thing is that it's not restricted to a server um, uh, browser environment, but basically it's an open standard that allows communication over any sort of transport. It's standardized by the sense that it's approved by the IETF and the W3C consortium. And it's implemented uh, within all major programming languages so far. So WAMP itself is a, a protocol that sort of combines two sub-protocols into one whole. Uh, the first is RRPC, which is Routed Remote Procedure Calls. And the second is PubSub, is Publication Subscribe. And RRPC, uh, is a uh, well-known older method in the sense that it allows for uh, communication between a caller and a colleague. So the caller asks, uh, sends data to the colleague, asks it to perform uh, operation or something, and the colleague, when ready, sends data back. And the fact that there is a dealer in between it, a crossbar in this case, ensures that we can do this in an asynchronous fashion. So the dealer accepts the results from the callee and passes it along to the caller. And uh, in doing so, the caller first gets an object which is called a, promises, a promise, which is an abstract object that sort of holds the result that gets yielded in a later time period. And uh, in the meantime, the caller can do various other activities uh, up to the point where uh, the data becomes available. Publication subscribe uh, is a slightly different way in which uh, a subscriber um, can subscribe methods to the broker saying, if I have data uh, for this method, I publish it to the broker. Um, a publisher can do that. And a subscriber uh, subscribes all the messages that it is interested in at the broker. And the broker will pass all those messages to all the subscribers uh, once they become ready. And it's sort of a one-to-many communication paradigm. And these two combined provide a very nice architecture to do uh, uh, dynamic real-time communication between the various microservices. So we use this concept, Crossbar as a broker and WAMP as a, um, a messaging protocol as the basis of uh, MD Studio. So in short, uh, an example of what that would look like um, in a schematic manner is depicted here, where in the center we have our MD Studio application, the broker, crossbar, and connected to it, uh, various microservices that perform tasks. We have a docking microservice, a so service that provides topology features, molecular dynamics, and for instance, a database to store results. So in the middle again, we have the crossbar broker. Crossbar itself, I said, is feature rich. And it provides a number of uh, features out of the box that are very important in architecture like this, so it's such as authentication and authorization and security options. So we have the ability to provide fine-grained control over authentication, role-based usually, to sort of isolate the users or decide which user has access to which, uh, which microservice and how. And security for making sure that all of the communication is always in an encrypted fashion. The different microservices themselves um, operate within the architecture by wrapping them in the very small WMP API layer that sort of provides a formal description of the functions that the microservice offers uh, to the architecture as a whole. 
And that's a standardized protocol. It's currently available in 13 different languages, which makes sure that uh, no matter what the application uh, language is in which the application is written, and most of the time there is a WAMP API available to make that application work in microservice architecture. And the communication that we use is JSON-based uh, with schema support, which means that we use JSON schema as a way to formalize uh, the, the type and uh, the layout of the API and the data that is being passed along uh, between microservices. And it gives us the ability to validate it and to provide things like uh, backwards compatibility and versioning. So the microservices themselves, um, they run as individual processes within the whole, so they're always live. Uh, they can make use of the CPUs that are available in the, in the, uh, the environment where uh, the system as a whole runs. But they can also run on, um, on different types of uh, hardware resources like dedicated clusters uh, where um, uh, high performance computing is or uh, where specific databases are located or where the data itself is. We can make sure that microservices live close to the data or close to the metal in case of uh, hardware requirements. And we provide uh, specialized Docker containers to make uh, deploying these microservices uh, easy by means of a Docker. So having said that, um, in a microservice, basically everything in a microservice architecture in MD Studio, basically everything operates as a microserver. Uh, and it also means that uh, the user that is eventually interacting with this architecture by itself also is a microservice. So um, the user interacts with it throughout the WAMP API and therefore is a microservice in the whole. And the benefit of doing like this is uh, that we can offer uh, the user different ways of interacting with the microservices or using it to chain it together into workflows. And its basic level uh, would be uh, immediate, real-time and interactive um, communication with the microservices and with the functions. So it's sort of uh, launching a, a Python interactive shell or uh, doing any interactive modes, directly sending uh, commands to the functions in the microservices and getting data back. Uh, that's a really powerful way of uh, fastly working with the diverse functions that are available in the structure and making use of the HPC backends that are in it. And we are currently looking in ways for extending the, uh, the capabilities of this by, for instance, injecting um, interactive sessions like the very well-known uh, Jupyter Notebooks right into the WAMP uh, session. One step up would be to um, write small scripts uh, in any of the 13 languages that are provided calling the different microservice functions and chaining them together uh, to make a functional whole. Uh, we also launch, uh, we also built a microservice that is dedicated to build workflows in this type of architecture. So that is a more structured way of chaining them together, which is good for um, ensuring provenance of the entire system. And that sort of functions like much of the other types of workflows that are currently on the market and um, providing it sort of like a graph way, a graph representation of the uh, workflows that are chained together, making sure that data is passed on from one uh, function of the microservice into another until the, micro, uh, until the workflow is finished. And last but not least, um, there's also a WAMP API uh, available for JavaScript and we use this feature to generate web based or browser based graphical user interfaces that interact with the microservice architecture. So most of the abstraction layers that are uh, available in workflow managers are available within this one architecture, simply by using different ways of communicating with it, interacting with it. Um, apart from having specialized microservices that do things like MD and docking, it's always useful to have general microservices that provide common functionality that, that people are used to in, um, in applications and may want to use in workflows and in the sessions. Examples of that are databases. So we have a microservice uh, abstraction to a MongoDB database. We, it's a basic data allows for all the microservices that want to store data to have a common interface to store data and retrieve data from. 
Same is true from a locking surface. So we have a structured locking surfaces that uh, provide a center point for locking in the entire infrastructure, even if it's distributed over different machines in the environment. User management, of course, and specialized services that provide adapters to uh, different computational infrastructures, such as uh, adapters that can communicate with uh, uh, queuing system clusters or specific nodes, uh, GPU environments and such. So having said that, what would a microservice architecture look like in, um, in our ETOX Alliance workflow? So in this graph that I show you here is a workflow um, description of ETOX Alliance, where all the different spheres are, in this case, microservices that live in our architecture that are chained together uh, to perform the eventual function of predicting binding affinity for small ligand for a protein. And that means that the workflow in this case accepts a uh, protein input structure and a ligand input structure. And we offer the ability to provide that as a file or extract it from a web server, extract it from a database. And it's fed in um, to the workflow and the ligand usually is defined as a um, extract things like a smile string or a 2D representation. So there's a, a little component in one of the microservices that is has a task to convert um, this to a 3D representation of the ligand, perform things like protonation and uh, charge definition. Then of course we want to be able to, uh, to, to automatically define topologies for this system. And we have various ways of doing that. Uh, one of the ways is to use the uh, well-known program AC pipe, that uses Ember tools to create topologies on the fly. But the other option that we have is to use the automated topology builder, uh, with our collaboration with LMARC, for which we also have a microservice uh, to create a bit more um, high quality way of generating topologies. And depending on the choice, both of these can be fed into uh, uh, to the final MD stages. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we dock the ligand in the active side of uh, the, the protein question. In this case, we're also often the cytochrome as a protein. We do this using a fast docking method called plants that is also available as a microservice. Um, it's, a, it's a fast docking method in the sense that it can create um, general acceptable confirmations of the ligand poses in the active site in a matter of seconds. But we may want to uh, switch plants for a better docking methods or different docking methods. Uh, example would be Haddock, one of the partners in the BioXL. Uh, community for which we with, which we also collaborate to offer their functionality as a microservice within our ecosystem to do the docking in sense. And after the docking, we do a clustering and we derive various um, confirmations of the uh, poses of uh, the ligand in the active site and fed that into uh, short molecular dynamics. And we have a in the workflow system that we define the sort of dynamic way to spawn new molecular dynamic instances for all the confirmations that uh, come out of a docking uh, stage uh, in the dynamic system and uh, pass them along to the uh, MD microservice that has a high performance computation backends to perform it in an efficient manner. That data then comes back uh, and is after a filter stage to extract stable regions in the trajectory uh, and extract the um, non-bonded uh, electrostatic and van der Waals parameters the data is fed into the final stage, which performs the actual LIE uh, prediction. And that uh, particular microservice itself is a embedded workflow. So there are several data processing and um, uh, data manipulation stages involved in that. And we have the ability to uh, embed uh, common or different workflows as a workflow in a larger workflow. So embedding in this case makes it easier to reuse um, um, sort of general workflows uh, in a larger workflow. Uh, this type of workflow has two stages in it that may require certain attention from the user um, in a sort of interactive way. So one way would be the plant docking stage to make sure that all the confirmations that uh, that microservice yields make sense before spending uh, computational intensive MD stages on them. And we allow in our workflow methods to define uh, simple breakpoints at various stages in the workflow. The user is notified once that breakpoint is entered to review 
uh, the results that come out of the microservice, make changes if needed, and then continue on. And those breakpoints only have influence on the part where um, uh, that particular microservice is involved in. So if there are other routes in the workflow that do not involve that breakpoints, they continue on running. And another interactivity point would be the final stage, the LAE prediction, in particular in the case of modeling, which is a pretty interactive procedure where a lot of chemical intuition of the user is required to make a general model. And that interactivity is also allowed in this workflow. I already mentioned a little bit about the different abstraction layer and our uh, ability to also provide graphical user interfaces that operate with the molecular uh, within the uh, microservice architecture. Uh, it's currently something that we're not actively developing, but we ventured into um, trying to see how that would operate and what the benefits of it are by providing an interface to uh, one of the steps in the ETOX allies workflow, and that is the, um, uh, the filtering after the MD stage. And uh, that filtering step is important because we uh, are interested uh, to make sure that, that only stable regions in the trajectory uh, are used to extract average values for van der Waals and that static components from. So we made to make sure uh, that those regions, those stable regions, are accurately selected. And we have automated procedures to, um, to go over the molecular dynamics trajectories and to isolate stable trajectories and does a very well job, pretty good job, but uh, it, it may fail from time to time and there is a good reason to, to go over this in an interactive fashion to make sure that um, uh, the final selected regions are indeed stable. And this is an interface that allows you to do that. Um, it's built uh, using uh, Angular, which is a JavaScript framework developed by Google to make rich browser-based uh, graphical user interfaces. So this thing entirely lives in the browser, runs in the browser, and using the um, JavaScript WAMP API connects to the microservice environment, particularly to the MD component in there, uh, fetches all the information from the trajectory and displays them in a graph like this, where you see um, the trajectory and the van der Waals and static values that are along that. You can select them and then interactively uh, use sliders to reselect a certain region and then once saving, uh, it will be communicated back to the workflow that we're running to recompute uh, binding affinities based on the new information that's available. So this provides a sort of interactive way of working with the workflow and ensuring that new information is fed to the workflow to uh, update the data that runs out of it. So in conclusion, what I've hoped to show you is uh, that microservices provide quite a rich environment to build uh, workflows upon, and that we use that uh, in our vision uh, to use microservices for simulation and modeling uh, workflows in MD Studio. And in short, MD Studio in the long run has um, sort of includes a couple of very important benefits. Uh, first of all, MD Studio itself is a, a deploy anywhere software. It's self-contained, uh, both the broker crossbar as well as all the microservices that uh, live in the architecture. Uh, they can be set up as one application that runs on someone's personal workstation, laptop. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to the net, to the internet, or can be deployed as a central um, MD Studio. Um, server on a dedicated workstation in, in a research department, for instance, allowing others to connect to that infrastructure to work with the microservices, launch new workflows uh, in the various abstraction layers that I have showed you. Uh, because you can deploy it flexibly, you're, you, you'll be able to build your own application environment where you pull together all the resources that you have uh, available, like the clusters uh, to run computational heavy um, computations, uh, particular service that run databases and the individual workstations, the researchers that may want to interact with the environment in a very flexible way. So it's, a, uh, it's suitable to build applications using the environment that you have at hand. Uh, because of the various ways uh, you can interact with a microservice environment, uh, a researcher can basically work with it in the way they, in the way that they like either inter interactive, script-based, using workflow environment, or even 
with the graphical user interface uh, is available. And because um, MD Studio by itself is multi-user ready, we also have the ability to provide the group stability to collaborate together uh, by providing an environment, role-based, group-based, uh, to, to communicate with the same microservice, the same workflow, to share results and uh, work on the same data, uh, the same project simultaneously. Uh, that's a vision and all of that together, uh, we hope MD Studio will grow. At the moment, we are in uh, active development to provide a prototype that uh, uh, showcases the functionality of MD Studio based on our ETOX allies workflow. And from that point on, we will extend the workflow to incorporate new microservices. And in that, uh, we certainly hope that uh, other users in the community that have very valuable methods that they want to contribute to microservices will be able to do so. And we'll make sure that the WAMP layer required to, uh, as a wrapper around the functionality to have it operate in microservices be, uh, can be deployed as easily and uh, straightforward as possible. And as such, we hope uh, that the ecosystem will grow in time and uh, be beneficial uh, to many in the uh, simulation and modeling environment, but certainly also outside because the uh, basic architecture uh, as it is right now is not limited to simulation and modeling only. So having said that, I would like to certainly thank all the people involved in uh, the development of uh, MD Studio. Uh, so that's uh, obviously the people from um, our own group, uh, Daan Gierke, Koen Visser, Paul Visser, the people from the Science Center, uh, Lawrence Veen, and the collaborators, uh, for instance, the group of Alan Mark and uh, Kurt in the, uh, uh, from the A2B server. Finally, I would like to draw your attention that we will also be present at the BioXL Community Forum in November, and we certainly hope to have that prototype ready by then, uh, so we can give you a demonstration and you can get a hands-on of how things work and you can uh, hopefully draw your attention to uh, uh, collaborate with us and perhaps contribute your own microservice to the environment. And with that, I uh, would like to thank you uh, for your attention and hand over controls back to Adam. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for that interesting talk. Um, so I can see that uh, the questions have started to come in. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, please just type it into the, the question box in, in GoToWebinar and then I will go through them one at a time. Um, I do have a couple of questions myself, but I, I'll, I'll start by taking the questions that are coming in from the floor. Um, so um, Zara, you have a question there. I, if, do you have a microphone? Do you want to um, unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Mark? Uh, it's the little, I think you can just push on the little orange microphone to unmute yourself. Maybe I can unmute you. If you don't have a microphone, then uh, I can um, read out your question. Can you talk directly, Sarah? Yes, I've been unmuted. I, I couldn't unmute yeah, myself. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Loud and clear. Yeah. Loud and clear. Perfect. That was really great. Thank you. Um, you know, this is definitely, uh, I think, what the uh, communities are looking towards, how, how to make um, uh, you know, uh, software available um, and how you can have workflows where you can bring in different methods as and when you need. Um, and, and I know in BioXL there's a lot of groups that are involved in this and will BioXL be encouraging the partners um, in the consortium to uh, make the methods available through microservices? Um, and also, so that's one question, then looking ahead, how would you envisage people looking up microservices? Because I guess, you know, you can imagine in future there'll be quite a lot to choose from. Will there be some kind of directory where people can look at what's available? Um, yeah, do you want to take the second one? Yeah, and then I'll go back to BioXL. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'll first ask, uh, answer the second question and I'll leave the first one to, to Adam. Um, uh, for certainly, we hope uh, that others will indeed contribute their methods. And one of the ways that we try to do this is as soon as we have a good prototype is to set up a website where you can actually download the uh, environments to start playing with yourself. Uh, but we hope to also provide a uh, common uh, database or directory for people to, uh, to upload their microservices or provide uh, download locations for their microservices. Mm -hmm. so that others can uh, quickly install that in their environment to start using it. So mm -hmm. see it as a sort of uh, marketplace, as you will, 
uh, for mm -hmm. sharing these uh, environments. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I can't help but draw parallels with Pipeline Pilot. So for instance, with that, you can mm -hmm. share work, workflows. So if you've optimized a workflow, maybe published it, and people say, I want to use that. So you can make that available. Um, and then also you can make components available. So you can look up uh, you know, two, two different parts. The components here would be the microservices. Um, so, so if it's possible to to somehow make um, the microservices and and these overall workflows available, that that would be great. Yeah, definitely, uh, and certainly also for the work uh, for the workflows themselves, because uh, mm -hmm. that, that's where a lot of logic goes in, and it makes it's, it's very mm -hmm. valuable to share those with others. So, I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And to, just to quickly take uh, the first part of your question, um, will BioXL be encouraging? partners to, to make their, their services available. I think it was already mentioned that, uh, that Haddock is one of the, the microservices that has already been, well, one of the codes that has already been looked at um, in this, this context. Um, so there's at least at least one code that we're, we're looking at uh, how, how it might work uh, in this way. And there's also more general work going on in BioXcel um, in terms of, of workflows and wrapping components from workflows so that they can be used in, in different contexts. And I think um, that this, these kind of microservices could be included um, in that potentially. And uh, by the end of the BioXL project, we will have our own catalog of some of the services that can be um, used. I think that's being done in conjunction with um, Elixir. I don't know, I think, uh, I think I've spotted that one of my BioXL colleagues is, is in the room um, Adam, I don't know if you've got a, a microphone. You might want to comment on that in a minute, <laughs> just to, to put you on the spot. Um, but it, I don't know whether that's something that, that uh, it seems to me that in principle, there's no reason why these, these mm -hmm. components couldn't be um, made available alongside some of the other workflow components that we're, we're looking at yeah. in the project. So, that would so be yes. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Zara. Um, uh, Stephen, do you want to? To ask your question next, and then I can um, move on from there. Stian, do you have a microphone? Oh, I'll have to maybe make you uh, um, just a second. I will unmute you. Okay, Stian, you should be able to answer your ask your question directly now. If uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's a very interesting. Uh, approach and I, and I like the little technical deep into how as a workflow person to see how, how that works as well with the web socket and microservices now I, I just, just just a comment on the previous questions I think we we also should look at coordinating with our efforts on tool descriptions and tool uh, packaging like bio containers and bioconda because this is kind of taking it to the next level why right? it's not just some some binary where you run up, but it is something that is active that you can talk to and, and put together. So, so definitely lots of interesting things to that. Now, my question is just a bit more practical because if people are going to do this, the first question is how do I put my favorite tool into it? So you mentioned you have to have some kind of wrapper for the WebSocket application messaging protocol. Is, is that something that's easy to do? Is there some kind of tools to help you? Or are you kind of like a lift bit on your own when you want to do that? Uh, no, not at all. Um, so our broker is Crossbar. And uh, within that consortium of developers uh, are also developers that make the uh, WAMP wrapper. It's uh, a project called Autobahn. And uh, that is the community that develops these in 13 different languages, provide documentation and very good examples of how to use those, li those libraries in these 13 different languages uh, to build your own uh, microservice uh, using that API. And uh, that provides a very good start point for uh, coding them yourself. Uh, in addition, uh, we also could think about providing a sort of common wrappers where you could, for instance, uh, wrap uh, executables or command line libraries uh, in an easy way in, so you don't have to uh, worry too much about the technical details of the WAMP communication, but simply provide a list of functions that you want to expose, and they are exposed. Okay, so you can kind of change a command line to a function if you want, although it might not be as performant. 
it might not be as performance, um, but that, that might be one of the ways to go to, to quickly expose. We haven't had, we don't have that ability yet, but it it's, could be a way to do it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Stu. Thank you, Mark. And um, do we have any other questions from the floor? Um, feel free to to type them in. If you do, uh, while people are are doing that, um, I did have. Uh, well, my first question was similar to, to Stian's actually. Was uh, uh, how do I, how would you actually wrap something up to use it as a component? But my so my second one then is uh, sort of a bit more general. Um, if if I wanted to experiment more with this and, and try it out myself. Uh, what's the what's the best place to start? Um, are, are there uh, examples of things that can be, be downloaded, or what what would I need in order to get started with with wrapping a component, or indeed as an end user, uh, is there anything that can be um, downloaded yet to to try out how it works, or is it still at a prototype stage? Yeah, a very good question. Uh, we are still at a prototype stage and uh, therefore I do not have a website out download location yet that I can uh, share with you. So that's a pity on one cent, bearing with, bearing with me to, uh, uh, to get that done. Um, but as I said, we, we will be at the BioXL community and we definitely hope to have that prototype ready by then. Uh, maybe not with a full featured website, you can have all listing, but definitely with a download location that you can download the package and start playing with it. And we will make sure that that uh, package then includes a couple of basic microservices uh, that you can use in a functional hole to, to see how, to get a feel how it works and start playing with it yourself. And the nice thing about uh, the packages itself, uh, it, it sort of operates as a, a single application that comes with a sort of setup file that launches uh, the crossbar router and a number of uh, other microservices in one go. Uh, so it sets up the environment automatically. So it's, it's more to give you the feeling that you are working with a solid uh, application rather than a heterogeneous, uh, loosely coupled set of microservices. Uh, and that, that allows you, I think, to, to quickly get up and running with uh, using the framework. So ho hopefully uh, in November, uh, I can, can share download location and uh, show it to you. forward to that. That's great. Thank you very much, Mark. Yep. Um, one final end question from Lee, unless we've got any other questions from the floor. Um, the uh, One of the things that it was mentioned on one of your slides, you mentioned HPC adapters. Um, I just yep. wondered what what they were, what whether that's a specific feature that's something to do with um, High performance computing or very large computers, which are of course interested by Excel. Well, microservices themselves are not. I will try to elaborate on that a little bit more. So, so microservices themselves don't have a, a native focus on performing uh, on offering high performance compute capabilities. I mean, they are a convenient way of linking together um, functionality in a uh, in a flexible, more or less interactive way. Uh, but obviously, HPC is a component of it, definitely if you want to use it for molecular dynamics and simulation. Um, and therefore, we want to make sure that when we um, deploy an MD microservice that has access uh, to some kind of uh, high performance backend in any form or whatever it may be. And that can be pretty heterogeneous because uh, people have access to, to local clusters, to uh, national compute facilities to GPU uh, clusters to um, now name it and that's that's it. So providing one solution uh, won't be enough, and therefore going for a sort of adapter-like fashion, where you have adapters that can communicate with queuing systems, uh, uh, with cloud infrastructures, with grids, uh, provide a way of uh, uh, linking that, offering that one microservice, the MD microservice, for instance the ability to spawn yawns on these various types of infrastructures. Um, th that, that's what I actually mean with HPC adapters. Okay, no, that's useful. You, you mentioned a few words there, the batch system, which, <laughs> uh, which I was wondering about, because that uh, is always something that people have to contend with when they're, when they're thinking of very large simulations. Okay, I think um, in that case, we will bring 
today's uh, webinar to a close. Thank you very much indeed, Mark, for your talk today. And um, to everyone else, I hope you can join us for um, our next webinar, which I expect to be in a few weeks' time. And if you are interested in the community forum, do please go to our website and have a look there. Um, and uh, yes, if you have any questions that occur to you later to follow this up, please go to our forums at Ask Bio Excel and you can post a question there and we will follow up later. Thank you all for coming along and um, we will see you again soon.